So uh, we're speaking today to Stefan Graziadei, who has written an article for Contemporary Southeastern Europe on uh, power sharing constitutional courts. Maybe you can tell us briefly what uh, that kind of concept uh, means. What is the argument of your article? Um, well, um, I think I start um, how I um, how I was starting with the article. Actually, first I was trying to write about um, judicial in a, in a dependence in Bosnia, and after that, talking with different colleagues, I saw the intuition that uh, there was a similar model of organizing the judiciary and highest courts, not only in Bosnia, but also in Belgium. And uh, these, these cases like Bosnia and Belgium, they were seen as something which is um, an exception, which, is, uh, which, which does not have any pattern. Belgium and Bosnia were seen as really special cases mm -hmm. that, of the organization of judiciary uh, that one would see nowhere else. But what I was trying to do was to, I was seeing that there was a certain pattern of organizing the judiciary, especially highest courts, in uh, certain type of societies and in these con associational democracies or confederal states like in Bosnia, in South Tyrol, to a, to a certain extent also in uh, Northern Ireland, in uh, Cyprus, in Belgium, you saw that there was Constitutionalism was not only existing in the political sphere, but was also transferred to the judiciary. And the judiciary in these cases are often in uh, institutions which are designed to solve also certain conflicts, which are not also conflicts between different laws, but sometimes also deeper conflicts of another kind of politics between different communities. Mm -hmm. And um, so I saw that there is a model of, of not only representing a certain salient diversity within a court, but also a model how to share power within a court. That means to see who has certain positions of power within a court, how can decisions be taken within a court. So it was basically certain pillars of the constitutional system that one sees in the political sphere can also be seen in the judiciary. And so what the main argument was and what I try to convince uh, the readers and other scholars is that there is a certain pattern, that there is a certain model of organizing the judiciary in deeply divided places that is an analogy also to the, to the mm -hmm. associational system in the political sphere, although, of course, it works differently. Mm -hmm. So it is basically about solving, uh, solving conflicts through law mm -hmm. and certain in a institutional model that allows for it. But is it solving um, problems through law? Because, I mean, critics, especially in the Bosnian case is the one which is often given, uh, would argue that the court is very politicized. So it's not actually solving problems through law, but it's rather politicizing law. Um, court, uh, constitutional court appointees often follow um, ethnic lines in their voting patterns. They, uh, they support decisions which are seen as being beneficial for their community or reject them. So um, is this really a viable problem-solving mechanism or is it actually uh, just the penetration of power sharing into all spheres of, all spheres of institutional life, including courts? Uh, well, I think that that's... Uh I think that that's the question that you're having. I think it's a very uh, interesting and important question, and I think it's it is also difficult to um, to uh, to give a clear answer on it. What I would say is that by judicializing certain kinds of conflicts, uh, political conflicts, you you take away some of the salience because mm -hmm. it's not mediated only through the language of politics, but also through through, through the language of uh, of law. Um, I think you can secure uh, a bigger acceptance of these uh, mm -hmm. decisions. At least this is what you see in Belgium. In, in, in Belgium, for instance, you had in the, in the 1980s, the Constitutional Court was created and power was given to it. And the reason Prime Minister Seth Martens at that time said was to take away uh, conflict from the political sphere to the judiciary, mm -hmm. which would be more able to resolve it without creating problems for the grand coalition within the Belgian government. And then there might be systems which are more appropriate to that and others which are less appropriate uh, to, uh, to that. For instance, in Belgium, where you don't have dissenting opinions, it gives the court uh, a more, uh, sort of, it, 
uh, it, it is more difficult for outsiders to see how the court has taken a decision, mm -hmm. and that strengthens somehow the decisions of the court. Although you see that also in Belgium, certain decisions like the one on Brussels Halleville border were not implemented for eight or nine years and took the uh, took took the country to one of the biggest crises. Mm -hmm. But uh, yeah, I think that. Uh, and another example that I'm making in uh, the article is uh, the it's another case on Belgium. The, the, there were decisions of the Flemish section of the Council of State on the municipalities that are around Brussels and on the interpretation of the language le legislation. And the conflict was struggling on for 30 years because French speakers said the Flemish section of the Council of State was interpreting the law in a way that was functional to the interest of the Flemish community. So with the sixth reform of the Belgian state in 2012, it was the bilingual section no? mm -hmm. composed half of Dutch speakers and half of French speakers, which gave a new interpretation to the language law, which had a kind of a pacifying effect because both communities could live with the interpretation mm -hmm. of uh, of uh, this this uh, this court. So it's uh, it, it might not always work, but mm -hmm. by forcing uh, to, to, to take certain mm -hmm. decisions, uh, it uh, it it can give a contribution. And then there are certain maybe systems which can work better than others. For instance, in Belgium, you have a system of parity, mm -hmm. which allows the court to be a referee, but you have also a system of alternance that one year it is a French-speaking president, and the other year it is a Dutch-speaking president, which could take uh, the decision if there is a tie between judges from one community and the other community. And that creates uh, mm -hmm. a, 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 a balance of powers that, mm -hmm. that, that is not abused and that allows for decision making. Mm -hmm. yeah. Well in other cases then again this kind of balance is harder to achieve uh, and then you have in Bosnia the case of the international uh, judges as well right where where they are in a certain way an external party which are integrated into the court structure. Do you see how they, that shapes um, the war, the court as an arbiter? <sighs> yes, uh, I've, um, I've uh, written uh, a working paper also for the, for the University of Graz how uh, the appointment of uh, the Bosnian Constitutional Court could be changed. Mm. Uh, of course, the outs, of course, the international judges are outside, mm. are outside our arbitrators and they maybe take more into account uh, kind of supranational mm. law and uh, substantive uh, rules uh, for human rights and that, of course, is more functional to the to to a, to a certain interpretation mm. of Bosnian uh, institutional law. So, of course, they influence uh, they influence decisions on mm. on on, uh, on on key issues. But mm. often, it's maybe not directly in uh, international judges, but it's also like an interpretation of a supranational court, which international judges adhere to. Then, uh, this mm -hmm. is something that you saw, for instance, in the Pilaf case when it was discussed in Bosnia in two thousand six. Actually, two in two in uh, international judges voted for the local majority that uh, the power sharing system in Bosnia was not a violation of uh, Bosnian constitutional mm -hmm. law and uh, human rights law. But now, more uh, ten years later, with the other cases with vice presidents uh, at the entities, the international judges voted differently. Huh? And I think that the difference is not really that they were. The, the, the difference, I see it more that there was a change in case law mm -hmm. of, uh, of the European Court of Human Rights with the, mm -hmm. uh, the, with the Sadic judgment, with the Zonic judgment, with the Pilaf judgment, and these international judges being nominated by the President of the European Court of Human Rights tend to follow more this uh, supranational case law. Mm -hmm. but, Excellent. Well, I think there, there are some good points. Yeah. I, I think one would see it, for instance, in Cyprus, which is another case yeah. that was that would be modeled actually on, on, on Bosnia, with a parity of local judges and with some in, uh, international judges. I think that maybe a, a smarter, a smart design could uh, could uh, could uh, could, uh, could be to have international judges to have like a sunset clause for in, uh, mm -hmm. international judges to have, to have them only for a certain time, and then maybe move to a design which is similar to the one of, of the Belgian court, parity between different. Uh, communities to allow that decisions are being taken. Well, thank you for sharing some thoughts on the article. I think the area which you've outlined is that the kind of looking at courts as part of the power sharing structure is a relatively new field of inquiry. I mean, only in recent years have scholars of power sharing been looking at courts as part of the, the infrastructure, looking at parliaments, governments in the past. So I think your article 
you know, kind of speaks to a, a key, a key emerging debate on, on, on the area. Um, yeah. If I may say still uh, something else, another debate is also which is coming out more is are these certain structures illegal with, uh, with, uh, new, with new human rights law? And my opinion is that also in a, that, that one should take, or that one should see also how the legitimacy of law is constructed in these societies. And in my article, I also mentioned some examples in Bosnia. Mm -hmm. So like when the uh, Serb national, so when the high representative vetoed judges proposed by the Serb National Assembly, the, the court was not taking any decisions because they knew that without the Serb judges, uh, the, the, the decisions would lack in legitimacy. Mm -hmm. So I think in these kind of uh, societies, like in South Tyrol, like in, uh, in Cyprus, in Bosnia, in Belgium, in Northern Ireland, in these type of divided societies, it is important that, uh, that the court is a broad legitimacy. Then there are always different techniques on how you can uh, achieve that. The power sharing court is just, the, it's just kind of an extreme model of mm -hmm. diversity management. Then you have other systems, for instance, the one in Catalonia where judges have to be bilingual. No? So mm -hmm. you have a, you 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 have just as in the diversity management, you have uh, corporate power sharing courts. You have more liberal yeah. examples of power sharing courts, and then you have all sort of different models, just which are uh, not, which don't have a certain ascriptive category, but just a certain requisite of language knowledge for mm -hmm. uh, acceding. So there are different models of. Uh, diversity management. Mm -hmm. And one of my points was that it, it also depends a little bit on uh, the function of this court. Mm -hmm. you know, if, if, uh, if, if a court does not really play uh, the arbiter function anymore because there are very few cases or because it is not needed anymore, then maybe having an in a institutionalized ethnic system in the court is also less necessary. Mm -hmm. Great. This, Thank you. Yeah. Lots of material to read, lots of material to discuss, and certainly an, a, a rising area of interest and in research. Uh, Stefan, thank you so much for talking to us about your article.